People ask me, what do I do with the concentrated sunlight if I concentrate it? My response is, it's up to you what you do with it. Concentrated sunlight simply has a greater value. It yields greater heat, so you can do anything from cooking to welding, melting steel. Additionally, because it gives you a hotter hot, your Carnot efficiency is improved for something like solar thermal electric if you want to boil water and turn a turbine with that concentrated sunlight. Or you can use a high efficiency photovoltaic with this very intense sunlight. How do we concentrate sunlight? Mirrors and lenses? Is concentrating sunlight breaking the second law of thermodynamics? I'm curious. The total entropy in light is equal to its spatial entropy, how much it occupies, plus the angular spread, how disorganized the angles are. See, the sunlight isn't perfectly parallel. The sun has an apparent cross-section of half a degree, which means that if you look at all the different rays that come from the sun, their total angular spread is about half a degree. And so what happens when you concentrate sunlight, you have less spatial entropy. It's smaller, but the angular spread increases, and so therefore entropy is conserved. And so you can't concentrate diffuse sunlight because its angular spread is already 180 degrees, as big as it can be. For line concentrators that concentrate light onto a line, you can achieve about 70 times the concentration of regular sunlight. And for two-dimensional concentrators like dishes, you can get up to the concentration of sunlight on the sun's surface, which is a concentration of about 58,000. But for most of our purposes, our dish concentrators are about 1,000 times the intensity of regular sunlight. As we learned in the last chapter, if you concentrate sunlight down very much, you can use a triple junction gallium arsenide cell, which is very expensive but has a very high efficiency. With, le with these large parabolic troughs focusing light onto a glass tube full of oil, we can transfer that heat to water, boil it, and turn a turbine. These solar facilities out in the Mojave Desert were built in the 70s by a company called Luce from Israel. And they've produced electricity very reliably for the past 30 or 40 years. However, when Ronald Reagan came into power, and incidentally, as soon as he moved into the White House, removed the solar panels from the roof of the White House that Jimmy Carter had put in, Ronald Reagan also removed some of the tax benefits and subsidies for solar energy. And therefore, the companies went bankrupt. The manufacturing company for these facilities went bankrupt. But the facilities themselves continue to generate electricity. And for the last four decades have also generated a significant amount of technological and scientific data to improve the technologies. So let's take a look at how can we concentrate sunlight from parabolic troughs or for dishes, sterling energy systems, and solar systems. These here are people for scale. This is a solar tower, which is also called a central receiver, a power tower, or a heliostat. We can also use lens or a Fresnel lens. The advantage of these are that they are easily scalable for rooftop. Now the parabolic trough, because it only focuses light in one dimension, gives lower concentrations, as I've said before. But because it has single axis rotation, it's going to be much cheaper than these parabolic dishes. And you can see this seems as though it would be very expensive. So how do we convert this to electricity? There's two ways. We can use solar thermal electric, where we use the intense heat to boil a working fluid, or we, can, or we can focus the sunlight right onto high efficiency photovoltaics. These conversion mechanisms are a turbine or a Stirling engine, some reciprocal engine. The turbine is very large, but the piston machines are modular. You can make many of them. The high efficiency photovoltaic, it allows you to use photovoltaics that have a higher efficiency and are therefore more expensive. When people say concentrated solar power, they're generally referring to these large-scale solar thermal electric facilities. Their advantages are they're well-established for the past 40 years, the smaller modular designs that are closer to where people live or work. The waste heat can be used to heat water, the house, or to drive an absorption cooler. The high-efficiency photovoltaic is scalable to all sizes. It's important we understand all four focusing methods can be used with all three electrical conversion technologies. So you can have a dish drive any of these. For example, this is a Stirling engine from Stirling Energy Systems. That goes right here 
at the focus of this parabolic dish. However, Solar Systems puts a high efficiency photovoltaic at the focus. The solar power tower in Barstow has a turbine that's heated with the concentrated sunlight that hits the tower, but they could also put a high efficiency photovoltaic right there at the center. Soul Focus is a company that uses high efficiency photovoltaic at the focus here. And you ask yourself, could we use solar thermal electric? And I think you couldn't because these are all very small. And so you'd have a problem with dissipating your heat before you got it to turn a turbine. One advantage of a turbine is it's dispatchable. You can use thermal storage as opposed to a high efficiency photovoltaic, which has variable energy generation. It changes over time. Let me show you. Here we have a schematic for a parabolic trough solar thermal electric facility. Here are all your troughs. This is your solar field out in the sun. And this heat is used to boil water and turn a turbine. However, you can also use this heat exchanger as a thermal storage device to melt and heat salt. And so you, you pump the salt from the cold tank through the heat exchanger into the hot tank to keep the heat for nighttime, for instance, or for when you might have clouds occlude the sun. Then you would run the hot molten salt through the heat exchanger again in order to continue boiling your steam. This is increased reliability, and this is one of the reasons we like this large-scale solar thermal electric with turbines. They're very lovely out in the desert, think many people. Other folks find them to be a nuisance and upset the local environment. As a result, there's a considerable amount of environmental conflict between the environmentalists who want these facilities because it's renewable energy and the environmentalists who don't want them. Here is a one megawatt pilot facility out in the Arizona desert. So we can see it's pretty small. One of the leaders of this technology is in Spain and here you can see the two tanks, one for the hot molten salt and one for the cold or cooler molten, molten salt. Again, a parabolic trough and a central tower receiver under construction. Osra had a very novel design where they, these are slightly parabolic and the sunlight is focused on these tubes under another solar reflector. Because they were face down, there was no convective cooling, and they were able to heat these tubes without the use of double wall vacuum, which made them cheaper. And as the sun moved, these bicycle wheel-like things on a track would turn, keeping the sunlight focused onto the heat receiver. Recently, Osra built a one megawatt test facility near Bakersfield and promptly sold their business, leading one to believe maybe the technology didn't pan out the way they thought it would. These data come from National Renewable Energy Laboratories in Boulder, Colorado. It predicts the cost reduction in cents per kilowatt hour as a function of the years for trough and for central tower receivers. We see them go very low, down to four cents per kilowatt hour. However, it's my perspective that concentrated solar thermal electric will not remain competitive against photovoltaics as they've become so inexpensive, they have no moving parts, and they have no they have very low maintenance requirements. One of the things I looked at with concentrated solar is the cost and expense related to tracking. Let's take a look at the associated requirements. You need a very well-developed frame and drive mechanisms precise to well under half a degree. The mirror is made of glass as well as a heat collecting element so they can't bend. You don't want them to break. And you have rotating pipe connections that have very heated fluid in them. So the question is what if this primary mirror didn't move? What if it was built right into the earth, kind of like the large telescope in Arecibo in Puerto Rico? Then you'd have a stationary primary mirror and a stationary heating element here, or heat collector. And as the sun moved, you would just redirect this focused area by means of a smaller, very light, easy to manufacture mirror. My students modeled this for several years. This is the result of our efforts. You can see as the sun rays change direction, you can move this mirror to refocus the light rays onto this central heating, onto this central heat collector. Our analysis, however, indicated, unfortunately, that the concentration and efficiency of collected rays was less than for regular parabolic troughs. Another interest I pursued with Craig Baltimore in architectural engineering was the potential for solar power in urban environments by putting solar collectors above buildings and parking lots. And the added value you get by having the waste heat 
very close to people that could use them in their house or in their businesses. Let's take a look at this analysis. This graph of the United States shows the number of kilowatt hours per square meter per day. So what does this mean? Well, we know that sunlight provides about 1,000 watts or a kilowatt per square meter. That is the intensity of sunlight. But we only have this for on the order of five, six, seven hours a day because at night we get nothing and at dawn and dusk, the intensity is much less because energy is equal to power times time. The energy that we would receive in one day for a square meter is about 1,000 watts times the number of hours that we get that sunlight or on the order of five or six kilowatt hours per day per meter squared. At very sunny places, we get up to 7,000. Where I grew up in Buffalo, where we never see the sun, we get about one or 2,000. So I did an analysis calculating what portion of the United States surface area would we need to cover with photovoltaics in order to generate enough electricity for all the transportation needs of the United States if we used electric cars and electric trucks. And I came up with about a tenth of a percent or one thousandth of the area of the United States in a sunny area. We could compare this with the amount of area we would need to grow corn on if we used corn to make corn ethanol to fuel cars with internal combustion engines. The surface area required is prohibitively large. So let's step back and take a look at what else do we use our surface area for? Lawns are probably the largest irrigated crop in the world, something that provides us with no food, and our present corn area, which does provide us with food. A similar analysis to this electric travel would be all of our needs, all of our energy needs of the whole United States could be met by covering 1% of the United States surface area with solar electric conversion and using electricity. Now, yeah, there'd be problems with airplanes, etc., but to get the raw amount of energy in electricity. So what do we compare this with? How about the fact that we already paved 3%? And so all we need to do is cover one-third of what's already paved with photoelectric conversion technologies. And so we thought about scaling down the solar power tower so it could fit over parking lots or possibly these trough designs. Certainly in the L.A. area, we can see there are enough very large surface areas to accommodate these kinds of solar thermal electric conversion facilities. Putting these in an urban environment near people would certainly cost considerably more than in a desert. What are the added benefits you get from this distributed generation of solar thermal electric? Rather than replacing electricity at production cost, which is about five cents a kilowatt hour, you could replace it at retail selling it directly to the customers which is 15 cents a kilowatt hour in California. This would allow you to bypass distribution and not need to upgrade the grid, which in California is really at its limit. Furthermore, rather than getting rid of the waste heat being a problem in order to cool your turbines, we could make very good use of this waste heat. We could use it to drive an absorption cooler that would replace air conditioners. We could displace natural gas for heating houses and water or industrial heating, such as cooking. This could increase efficiency, and it would provide a byproduct of shade. So while the production cost of present solar thermal electric is 12 cents per kilowatt hour, with these added benefits, this could potentially be competitive even if it were up to 40 cents a kilowatt hour because of all of the extra services you'd get. And lastly, the environmentalists wouldn't hate us because we wouldn't be impacting any environment or using water in dry regions. So what I'd like to leave you with is just a consideration of Surface area in the sun is very valuable to us. It provides us with energy on many levels, whether it be solar electric conversion or providing us with food or a place to live or entertainment. Our surface area in the sun is very valuable to us. Thank you.